Well, please remain standing and turn in your scriptures to Matthew chapter 4. I'm going to read verse 17 to chapter 5, verse 3. And then turn a few pages over to Matthew 7. And we'll read verse 24 to 29. We begin a series on the Sermon on the Mount. First of all, Matthew 4, verse 17, that's page 809 of your pew Bible. Then Matthew 7, verse 24, page 812. This is the Word of God. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father, and followed him. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And chapter 7, verse 24 Our Lord is closing the Sermon on the Mount with these words. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Thanks be to God for his word. Let us pray. And now we pray to you, Lord God, that we would be like those who hear these words of the Savior and do them. Give unto us your Spirit, Lord God Almighty, that we might be those who trust the goodness, the veracity, the grace and power of King Jesus, and we delight in serving him. Give unto us then your Spirit to work mightily in all that we do this night, for we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. We're starting a series on the Sermon on the Mount, and we must readily acknowledge that when we parachute in to the middle of any book of Scripture, we are in great danger of even failing to understand the passage in question itself. And that's why tonight I want to preach a very general sermon. We are going to, as it were, look at the text from 30,000 feet. We will be looking at the context of this sermon to see what it teaches us about our Lord Jesus himself. And then we'll, in broad relief, be looking at the sermon itself so that we have an idea of what our Lord is seeking to teach in the Sermon on the Mount. And there's two things I think our Lord is seeking to do in the Sermon on the Mount. The first is to portray the realities of his own coming. This is a sermon about the kingdom. 
We saw very clearly, chapter 4, verse 17, that the first words of his public ministry are these, repent, what? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then we see in chapter 4, verse 23, 24 following, he goes around proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom and the gospel are synonymous. Why? Because Jesus himself is the king of the kingdom. And Jesus is the gospel. We have then before us in the whole of the sermon a portrayal of the king himself. The king is pictured for us in this sermon. Everything he says speaks of the reality of what he has come to do in the world and in the church and in the life of a Christian. And then he calls us, we who are Christians, to live in like manner. Actually, what our Lord is showing us, at least in certain parts of the sermon, is what has and is being accomplished in us. We are being conformed to the image of Christ. That is, we are being made fit, as it were, for kingdom life. Tonight, I want us to look at the sermon as a whole and the sermon in its context And so we're going to allow, by God's grace and by the work of the Spirit, allow King Jesus to speak directly to you of himself and of the life that he calls each one of us to tonight. I want to do two things very simply. We want to look, first of all, at the king of the sermon, and then secondly, we look at the sermon of the king. The king of the sermon and the sermon of the king. Look firstly at the king of the sermon. Usually, the person who preaches the sermon is rather unimportant. It's very clear to us all, isn't it? The one who preaches the sermon is not himself the subject of the sermon. He is simply a mouthpiece. He is a servant that God uses to declare uh, the blessed truths of Scripture. But the Sermon on the Mount is much more than that. The Sermon on the Mount is preached by the king of the kingdom, and it speaks about the king of the kingdom. And so for us to understand the sermon itself, it's necessary for for us to understand the one who is preaching the sermon. It's necessary to understand that Matthew has gone to great pains in his gospel to give us a sketch of of who our Lord is, long before our Lord begins his preaching ministry. He doesn't begin his preaching ministry until chapter 4 and verse 17 of the gospel. What has happened, what has Matthew told us of this king from Matthew chapter 1 to Matthew chapter 4? He has given us a sketch of Jesus, who he is, what he has come to do, and how he has come to do that. Matthew's great emphasis is to present Christ as the fulfillment of Old Testament promise and prophecy to reveal that he is the king of the kingdom. And at his coming, the kingdom of God has come to earth. And so let's look at a very superficial level in a way about what Matthew teaches us about our Lord. Go back to chapter 1 and verse 1. The first thing we notice about Jesus is we're told something of his lineage. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. We have, first of all, his name. He is Jesus Christ. We know that these are theologically loaded names. Jesus, we're told in 121, you will call his name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus then, the one of whom this gospel speaks, we're told, is a savior. But he's also called Christ. Christ. Uh, That's a Greek equivalent of the name Messiah. King. And that kingship is testified to us in the opening verse of the genealogy. He is the son of David. He's the son of David through Joseph's lineage, not biologically through Joseph, but legally. He is biologically of the line of David through Mary, it almost certainly seems. That is to say, he is of the tribe of Judah. He belongs to the royal line. That is to say, this one born, Jesus Christ, 
has a right to the throne of King David. But we're also told that not just is he the fulfillment of the kingship idea, but he is also the promised savior. Why? Because he's the son of Abraham. Now, what was given to Abraham? Covenants and promises. Covenants and promises. What is said of our Lord Jesus Christ by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 1.20? We are told that all the promises of God find their yes and their amen in Christ Jesus. That is to say, there is not a single promise in all of Scripture which can be fulfilled without reference to the direct work of Jesus Christ. He's the son of Abraham. In that sense, he's the heir of all the promises of God, and he is the one by whose life all the promises will be brought to pass. Do you see what Matthew is saying? He's saying no ordinary king in the history of the kings of Israel could do what Jesus is going to do for his people. No king could fulfill the covenant, could keep the promises of God. This Jesus, who belongs to the lineage of David himself, will do everything necessary to actually bring about the covenants and the promises and the blessing. He will fulfill. He will render all obedience He will exercise a blessed and righteous rule. Why? He will even face the curses of the covenant that God had stipulated in the Old Testament. Why? Because he's going to save his people from their sins. The second thing that we note of him is his birth. We're told then of his birth in verse 18 following, and we're told of the divine intention behind that birth. It's an interesting fact as you read Matthew's gospel. Jesus is born as a baby. And humanly speaking, he's he's passive in that act. But for Matthew, this is the coming of the Christ. He's like other babies in their birth, passive. But he's unlike other babies in that this is his great coming, his first coming, when Messiah would come, when God would come incarnated. Listen to what he says, chapter 2, verse 6, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler. Chapter 3, verse 11, listen again, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I. Matthew wants us to know that in the birth of this babe, we have the very fulfillment of what God had promised in the old covenant, that God himself would come and shepherd and deliver his people. His purpose, 121, to save. How would he do it? 4.17, we read, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom had come with this babe as he was born. The third thing we note about our Lord is from where he came. You might think, well, we've already said that. He comes from the line of Judah, but there's something different about this babe. What hope would the people have that this king, this one of the line of David, would be any different than all the other kings that had come from the line of David? Look what it says in verse 23 of chapter 1. Quoting Isaiah 7, verse 14, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God himself, is going to come. God with us, we're told that Emmanuel means the son of David, the son of Abraham, is in fact God himself. All those sons from Abraham, all those sons from David could not do what this son is going to do. We know that in him we see all his power, all his grace, all his might manifested in the flesh. Veiled, as Wesley says, veiled in flesh, but there we see the Godhead. Notice how Matthew is introducing these truths. He's introducing them by means of citing the Old Testament. You flick through the first four chapters of Matthew, you're going to see him doing this time and time again. 
it's so important for his readers, for us to understand that the prophecies and the promises of the old covenant are coming to fruition at the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit is telling us, brethren, that what God has said he was going to do through promise and prophecy, he has done with the coming of Christ. God has done it himself. God has come in the flesh. Listen to what Thomas Mallory, the Puritan, says. In the works of creation, God is above us. In his works of providence, he is outside us. In the law, he is against us. In himself, he is invisible to us. Only in Christ is he, Emmanuel. God manifested in our flesh. He is God in us. He is God with us. And he is God for us. The Sermon on the Mount comes from this one who is God in us, with us, and for us. The fourth thing we notice about our Lord is that he is a shepherd. Look at chapter 2, verse 6. I've already read it. It's a quote from Micah chapter 5, verse 2. You, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Notice this ruler is a shepherd. I mean, it it harks right back to David, does it not? The, The king shepherd, the shepherd king. And yet, where were the rulers of Israel right now? Where were the shepherds of Israel? Herod the Great, an Edomite, is sat on the throne. Uh, The scribes and the Pharisees, the religious rulers of Israel, uh, were frankly no better than Herod himself. What has Christ come to do? He's come to do what the rulers, the kings, the shepherds of Israel had failed to do for centuries. He's come to shepherd his people. What the shepherds do? They gather. They care for They protect, they feed, and they lead the flock of God. This is Jesus, the preacher of the Sermon on the Mount. The fifth thing we learn is that this Jesus is to be viewed as the true Son, the true Israel. Chapter 2, verse 13. Uh, That's the narrative of the flight of our Lord and his parents down into Egypt. And we are told in verse 15, they remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. It's a quote again from Hosea chapter 11, out of Egypt I've called my son. It referred in Hosea to Israel, but clearly under the inspiration of the Spirit, Matthew has recorded that that actually is a prophecy of our Lord being called up from Egypt. That is to say, Israel, the son, has now been in some way replaced or fulfilled by Jesus himself. He is the true Israel. What was Israel? It was the son of God. What was their duty? Their duty was to live well before the Lord and be a light to the nations around them, to bring the nations in. And yet they failed which is why they were carted off into exile, which is why now Israel as a nation at the time of writing was under domination by a foreign power. Matthew is saying to us, the true Israel has come. The true son has come. And he has come to put right everything that the nation did not do. And he's come to put right everything the original son, Adam, could not do. He's come with a reign of of perfect righteousness and justice. His conduct in every single way is sinless and perfect. And that's what qualifies him, you see, to be a sacrifice. Brethren, we can't participate in the blessings of the Sermon on the Mount unless we have a union, a true and real union with Jesus Christ himself Every one of these identifying matters speaks to us of the need for faith in this Jesus. And if we have that true, sincere, saving faith, we are then united to this one who is king, who is the true son. We're united to his righteousness, 
We're united to his holiness. We're united to him in every single way. That's how we have worked in us a poverty of spirit. That's how we mourn over sin. That's how we are meek and so on. That's how we are light and salt in the world. It's through union with our Savior. Very briefly, let me speak to some other issues about our Lord Jesus. Who is he? Chapter 2, verse 23, we're told he is called a Nazarene. Probably that doesn't mean that he's a Nazarite, that's different, but a Nazarene coming from Nazareth, a king that comes from Nazareth, Galilee of the Gentiles. Immediately, that would set the minds of Jewish readers and us, because we know, along a certain path. Could it be that the king of kings actually came from Galilee of the Gentiles? That these are the people that he would serve and grow up in their midst? You see, it points us to the reality that the kingship of Christ Jesus is not of an earthly kind. His kingship is not of this world. He was raised and he ministered amongst those who were despised by the Jewish nation. Chapter 3, the first six verses, we're taught that our Lord was baptized. There's profound imagery in this baptism. What do we have? We have Christ going down into the River Jordan where John the Baptist had been baptizing those who had come to him, baptizing them with a baptism of repentance of sins. You've got some remarkable symbolism here. Whatever else Christ's baptism means, it means that Jesus is identifying with sinners. Just imagine, as it were, as Christ steps down into the Jordan. That water symbolically has been polluted with all the sins washed away By baptism, John's baptism, what does John do? He takes water, that same water filled with sin, and pours it on Christ. Surely a symbol of the transaction that would happen at the cross where he would take our sins. Yes, we're told that this king would redeem his people by being made sin, though he personally knew no sin. And that's borne out for us in the very next thing we're told of Christ, chapter 4, his temptation. His temptation. Tempted yet without sin, so that he can be a sympathetic high priest. He knows real temptation. He knows real temptation. He resisted. He came face to face with Satan himself. And as a true man, As we read earlier, Christ the Son of God became man by taking to himself what? A true body and reasonable soul. And as the true man filled with the Spirit, he resisted the temptations of Satan, was declared righteous, and it's only after that he begins his ministry. Round one over Satan to our Lord Jesus Christ. It is, as it were, that at that time he revealed to Satan and to the world he will not be defeated. He had already defeated Satan before his formal earthly ministry began. He was righteous. A righteousness that, as we read of in chapter 5, exceeded that of the scribes and Pharisees. This was one then ready and worthy to engage in his ministry. It's so important we understand, brethren, as Christ opens his mouth in chapter 5, verse 1 following, that we understand something of who he is. He's the king, the righteous king, the long-awaited king, the perfect king, who would come to bring about his reign of righteousness, justice, and equity, and he would bring people into that kingdom through his own death. Though he was righteous, he became polluted and stained by sin. Not personal sin, but by the imputation of our sins unto him. That's the king of the sermon. What a king we have. What about the sermon of the king? 
Again, we're flying rather, rather high altitude over this text. And I'm doing so intentionally. We can't touch on everything in one sermon, of course. I want this to be an impression upon you. What, what, what we're doing tonight is to create an impression. Don't worry if you don't get all the details. You are to be impressed. An impression is to be made in your heart about who this king is and what he's come to do in his teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. And I think the first thing we need to consider as we consider the sermon is what he does just prior to the sermon. Because chapter 4 verse 17 marks the second section of Matthew's gospel. It's laid out for us with these words from that time. We'll see again in chapter 16, verse 21, the next break in Matthew's gospel, again begins with those words, from that time. You see, this is the beginning of Christ's ministry. It's clear, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, which are synonymous, has come. And he says in 417, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He says words, notice it says, Jesus began to preach. Jesus preached. Later on, we'll read, he goes into the synagogues proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. That is one of the chief ways in which the kingdom would be inaugurated by his coming and by his preaching. He's going to exercise kingly rule and authority. How? Through his word, his powerful word. Word, And that's manifested very clearly for us in verse 18. What comes next in chapter 4? By his word, he calls people into service. It's the call of the disciples. He's walking by the sea, seeing two brothers, Simon and Andrew, casting nets. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Listen, immediately they left their nets and followed him. Cause and effect. And it happens again. Verse 21, he goes on, sees two more brothers, James and John, mending their nets, and he called them. And listen to what it says. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. There's the power just of the word of this king. He speaks and people hear. He speaks and people obey. That's the power of King Jesus. You see, he's come preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He's come to inaugurate his kingdom on earth to bring about firstly spiritual realities, spiritual changes. His kingdom, you see, is not of this world. There's not a call to arms. There's a call to repent. There's not a call for more education. There's a call to faith. And what does he do after that? He goes around revealing the power of the kingdom, not just in word, but in deed. He's proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and every affliction among the people. And what do they do? They bring more people who are afflicted. Listen, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, oppressed by demons, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Jesus healed them. He has come in word and in deed to bring about his kingdom. It's in this context, brethren, the Sermon on the Mount comes to us. Liberal theologians take the Sermon on the Mount, at least the bits they like about it, to be a manifesto for social change. But this is about the kingdom coming in our lives. What King Jesus, by his Spirit, has done and is doing in the Christian. The Sermon on the Mount, brethren, therefore, is going to challenge us But I say cautiously and encourage us, it ought not to depress us. It will challenge us. We can read these things and think how far I am away from the mark. And that's not a bad thought. But you'll notice the Beatitudes themselves 
don't set up, as it were, a standard of attainment. Rather, they set up a reality of what is being done in our lives and has been done. Not blessed are those who attain poverty of spirit, but blessed are those who are poor in spirit. What Christ has already done. This is the reality you see of his kingdom. He has come. He has brought a change in people. And so, brethren, we ought to come away from the Sermon on the Mount, yes, challenged, but in like measure, encouraged. This is what Jesus is doing in us, is doing in me, and has done in me. And by God's grace, you can say, I know myself 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and Christ has changed me. And he's changed me in these ways. Do I have a long way to go? Most certainly. Can I take my responsibilities in, in, in stricter and more serious measure? Most certainly. But we never divorce that from the reality of what Christ has already been doing. Let's look very, very briefly at the sermon in its constituent parts. Chapter 5, verses 2 to 12, speak to us of the blessing of kingdom life. This is not how to enter. This is about those who are already in, who are already blessed. An eightfold blessing pronounced upon the Christian. And here in the Beatitudes, as with the rest of the sermon, Christ is portrayed. Christ the King is revealed to us. And what is God doing by this text? He is conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ. The first four Beatitudes are Beatitudes of character, in a sense of our relationship to God. Notice this, they don't portray the Christian as strong, as unimpeachable, as strong-willed, as proud, as self-sufficient, as censorious, as opinionated, but rather they paint the opposite picture. The Christian is one who knows himself to be spiritually bankrupt. Pride is banished and humility is cherished. We are zealous for a standing that comes not from man but from God, not worldly traits but traits of the kingdom. Remember that. The traits that the world prizes are not kingdom traits. Second four beatitudes, if you like, they're fruit beatitudes, or particularly they relate to our relationship between each other. We see what Christ has wrought in us. We are merciful. We're pure in heart. We're undivided in heart. We are peacemakers because we know that God has made peace with us. And ultimately, we face some degree or level of persecution because of our faith in Jesus Christ. The Beatitudes are going to present to us not only what God has already begun to do in us, but it will also challenge us. There might need to be a radical reordering in the way we evaluate each other. And in fact, ourselves, not by the standards of the world, but by the standards of the kingdom. And having seen those graces wrought in us, our Lord says in verse 13 through to verse 16, how we then relate to the world. He says, you're salt and you're light. Salt is a preservative. Christianity slows the decline of of life and morality in the world. It slows it down, and as a light, it reveals that decline and shows it the better way of faith in Christ Jesus. That is to say, though we are in the world, we are not of the world. Though we rub shoulders with those in the world, we cannot be like them. Our character, our conduct, our speech, our work are visible, and in God's mercy, they have an impact. How does our Lord finish those words on salt and light? In the same way he says, verse 16, let your light shine before others that men may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The Christian is a witness, a salt and light in a dark world. So we're to conduct ourselves in a certain way. 
Our Lord follows that teaching with the standard of conduct. Between chapter 5, verse 17, all the way through to chapter 7, verse 12, the bulk of the sermon, our Lord is dealing with the principle of righteousness. What is the standard by which the Christian conducts himself? It is the law of God. It is the righteous law of God. This, chapter 5, verse 17 to 20, is in a sense the hinge upon which the whole sermon swings. He says, do not think I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Christ the King has not come to do away with God's law, but to bring it into its fullness, to fulfill. He fills up. He reveals the true sense of God's law. Why did he need to do that? Because the Jews had forgotten the sense of God's law. And that's made abundantly clear as we look at chapter 5, verse 21 onwards. Our Lord's going to deal with anger. And he says that unjust anger is murder. He deals in 527 with lust and says that if you lust, you have, cre- you have committed adultery. And he goes on, he deals with divorce and marriage, oaths, retaliation, loving your enemies. What are the standards? Not what the world says, not what the corrupt rulers and the false prophets 715 teach, but what I, the king, tell you it is. This is my kingdom, says Christ, and these are my laws. And that is the standard which is before us. And so high is this standard. Listen, chapter 5, verse 48 You therefore must be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. This is a non-negotiable standard. Righteousness desires and demands perfection. How do we practice that righteousness? What is our character like when we practice righteousness? Chapter 6, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people. Why? Because within us is that pride. We want the praise of man. Jesus says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. He says, chapter 6, verse 5, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and street corners that they may be seen by others. Our Lord's response, truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Fasting, chapter 6, verse 16. When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. The principle of practicing righteousness is this. Your Father, who sees in secret will reward you. Do not let your right hand know what your left hand is doing, says our Lord. Do not publicize your works of righteousness. Do it under the radar. Because you're not doing it for the praise of man. You're doing it for the glory of God. God who sees in secret will reward you also. What about our priorities? Our Lord speaks very clearly to these. Chapter 6, verse 19 following. Don't lay up for yourselves treasure on earth. If God gives you riches, praise the Lord for them. Nothing wrong with riches and wealth. But don't lay up treasure. Don't put your trust in those things. Because he says moth and rust will destroy them. He says where your treasure is there, your heart is also. Rather lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. You cannot serve two masters, he says. Where your treasure is, there is your heart. Immediately, he follows those words with teaching on what? Anxiety. Anxiety. Where does this fit into the sermon? What's going on? But he says, chapter 6, verse 25, Therefore, I tell you, Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, about your body, what you will put on. Isn't that interesting? Do not be anxious about your life. 
Why would we be anxious? Because we've laid up treasures on earth and our heart is there and we're fearful when we lose those treasures. Heavenly treasures are eternal. Moth and rust cannot destroy. Earthly treasures can be destroyed, can be stolen. They are here today and they can be gone tomorrow. If our heart is set on them, we are going to live a life filled with anxiety. Filled with anxiety. Therefore, because you serve one master, because your treasures are in heaven, because you love the Lord your God with all your heart and you are undivided in that, you need not be anxious. God will provide. That's what he says, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, what you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear, all these things will be added to you. There's the anxiety-free life. I know anxiety is broad, so I want to be careful. But there in the context here is the anxiety-free life. Serve one master, King Jesus. Before the sermon ends, we might be thinking, well, how on earth am I going to live a life like this? This is just way, way above my pay grade. What does he say in verse 7 of chapter 7? Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. What's Jesus saying? He's saying, pray. Pray. My kingdom is a kingdom where God hears the citizens of the kingdom. You need help living this life? Yes, we all do. Ask. Which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? All you have to do is ask. We have not because we ask not, says our Lord Jesus. What are we missing? I'm not talking about material goods, though that might be appropriate. What do we not have that we do not have because we have not asked for it? That's an interesting question we ought to ask ourselves. And he closes the main body of the sermon, 7, 7, sorry, 7 12, with what's been called the golden rule. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Elsewhere we're told that the law and the prophets is what? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind and all your strength and your neighbor as yourself. This is the great command, that we love the Lord our God and we love each other. And he brings the sermon to a close from verse 13 to the end. You see what he does? There's a call. The call of the gospel, chapter 7, verse 13. After he said all this about kingdom life, he says there's a way in. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Enter by the narrow gate. What does he say in John chapter 10 that he is the gate? He is the gate. And he's calling them because their rulers, their teachers are, as he says in verse 15, ravenous wolves. The scribes, the Pharisees, who could not teach with the authority that Christ taught, had taught the people lies. Ravenous wolves devouring them. And he says, you'll know them by their fruit. You will recognize them, verse 20, by their fruits. And thus you will recognize also the true shepherd, the true teacher, by his fruits. He's saying false teachers are, in fact, easily identifiable. Just look at them. Look at their lives. 
and then you will see the true teacher, Jesus himself. And he reminds them that not everyone in the kingdom, not everyone who says to him, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who goes through the motions of religious life in the church will enter the kingdom. There must be that true, vital, real connection with Christ manifested in what he says in verse 24, hearing the words of Christ and doing them. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. Hear the words of Christ and do them. What does he say to us? He says, repent and believe for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's been saying it for 2,000 years from pulpits of the church, of his church. And his word is real. His word is powerful. It accomplishes that for which he sends it forth. That's the conclusion, is it not, of the sermon. Verse 28 of chapter 7. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Their scribes, not the scribes, their scribes. Those who were given to the people or who had taken position to themselves, who taught with no authority. They were amazed at Jesus. There could not have been a greater contrast between Christ and these ravenous wolves. There could be no greater contrast between the fabricated righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees and the righteousness of Christ's life. There could be no greater contrast between the false leaders and teachers of Israel and the true leader and teacher of Israel. He spoke as one having authority. Why? Because he's the king of his kingdom. And so, brethren, in these coming weeks and months, may God grant us the grace to hear this king, to live well under his rule in his kingdom. Let's pray. We bless and magnify you, King Jesus. We praise you for grace and truth. We praise you for your word. We ask you, Lord God, that you will give us that faith whereby we live well under your rule. We delight under your rule. You are great, and there is none to be compared to you. We praise and bless your name, our great and high God. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.